Find a Bible and join me in the Gospel of John, the first chapter. Gospel of John, chapter 1. I need to thank you all. Um, thank you for singing like that. I, I get the idea that the words you just sang, you really believe. And your faith was coming out in that song as you praise God. And I know I was encouraged and built up. And thank you. Uh, that is the great reason we sing praise to God is reminding each other of faith and 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 opening our hearts to his word um we're going to be in John chapter 1 this morning and I would like for us to read the first 18 verses together in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life. And the life was the light of mankind. The light shines in the darkness. And the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only to witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, and his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, He gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father full of grace and truth. John testified concerning him. He cried out saying, This is the one I spoke about when I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Out of his fullness, we have received grace in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is Himself God, and is in the closest relationship with the Father has made him known. Let's pray. God, we want to bring you glory. We want to know you. We want to be in a relationship with you. And Father, we know your word leads us to that. And we pray, Father, this morning as we unpack this beautiful anthem that we would we would let it sink into our hearts and we would understand better what you've done in our world and our place in your plan. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Y'all like sandwiches? I like sandwiches. I really like sandwiches. Get, Get some good, good bread. And then you need to put your favorite condiment on both pieces, top and bottom. Get a little, for me it's mayonnaise, My dad thought mustard was the only condiment in the world. I thought I'd died and gone to heaven when I found mayonnaise. (laughs) And uh, 
And then you got your vegetables in there. You know, I, I like some olives and I like lettuce and tomato and, and I loathe onion. Just keep your onion at home. If you ever make me emperor of the world, you want onions on your hamburger, you have to bring them with you because it will be illegal to have them in the restaurant. They get mixed in with the lettuce and then you end up with onion on your no onion hamburger. I like cheese in there, you know, maybe two kinds of cheese. And then finally, finally, you get to the meat. That's what makes it a, that's what makes it a sandwich, right? No, no vegans in my family. We're, we're, we're all carnivores, big carnivores. So you got some kind of meat in there. Well, the Bible is actually filled with sandwiches. If you can follow this illustration, he'll, he'll start with a point and he ends with a point, And then he has a, a different one. It's kind of like the mayo in there. And then he'll come back to the mayo toward the end. And he'll, he'll have the vegetables in there on either side. And right in the middle, right in the middle is the meat he's trying to get to. As he leads to it, he leads back out of it. So he's coming in, getting to the point, and then he makes the same points on the way out. And that happens a lot in the Bible. And it happens in John chapter 1. I want you to notice the first point he's making. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Wherever you put the beginning... Keep going back and back and back. And wherever you put that beginning, the Word was already. Past tense, already there. He's two things. He's with God and He is God. With and is. Because our God is a Father and a Son and a Spirit. And the Son is with the Father, and the Son is God like the Father and like the Spirit are God. So He's with and He is God. Go to the end when He backs out of the account and we get the same point being made. Verse 18, no one's ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who's God Himself, has made him known to us. The point of the whole thing we're talking about here is God becomes one of us to show us what he is and to build a relationship between us and him. He is not only God himself, but he's also in the very closest relationship to God. He's made him known. Known is not just intellectual understanding. It's experience here. Because we don't just learn facts about God from Jesus. We actually come to experience God as we know Jesus and as we experience Him. That's the bread on the sides. He's moving in and He says, Through Him everything was made. Nothing's made without Him. He's going to come to the fullness of grace and truth in the end. And I want you to know the same power that created everything you see, touch, hear, smell, anything you can experience, God made it. And the Son of God made it. Nothing's made without Him. That same power, that same God who's able to do all that creation focuses Himself into grace and truth. Does that make everybody smile? Does it just make you grin to know God? God who's made all this loves us so much that He is pouring grace over us. Hebrews talks about us coming to His his throne. And His throne is not a throne of condemnation. It's not a throne of, of, of wrath, though God is a God of wrath at times. It, that's not what that throne is there. That throne is a throne of grace. I don't know about all of you. Well, I, actually, I do know about all of you because you're just like me. I'm in desperate need of grace. I don't want what I deserve. I am dark and broken, and I need forgiveness. 
I have sinned against my Creator. And in Jesus Christ, we see grace and truth. John here calls it his glory. We've seen his glory. There is a light shining in the darkness in verse 5. He starts in the beginning, and that takes us back to Genesis, doesn't it? Does everybody see that and hear that? John's actually going all the way back to when everything starts and God creates the world. And when God created the world, he kept making things and saying, that's good, that's good, that's good. And then he made a man by himself and he said, oh, that's not good. He's by himself. So he created a woman and now everything is very good. That was before the darkness came. The darkness came instead of listening to the God that made us in whose image we are and as image bearers of him we ought to reflect him. No, instead of that we listen to the darkness and we listen to the evil one and we sinned. That sin that came into the world separated us from the light. It separated us from the life not just physical death came, but, but a separation between God and man occurred because of sin. Because God is holy and sin is not holy. God is pure and sin is impure. And, and, and that connection is not possible because of who God is. And we're broken without Him. We're in desperate need of grace. But there's a light going to shine into that darkness. And the darkness is not going to win. You like that? There's days that the darkness beats me up. Anybody else in here like that? Is this a hand showing church? Anybody else get beat up by darkness? The little shadows in Bo's life try not to show them to everybody I don't want anybody to follow them but there they are and some days they seem to win and John says verse 5 the light shines in the darkness and the darkness does not overcome it I got to give you a little freebie this isn't part of the sermon this is just an extra okay so stop the watch okay you know this doesn't count against my time right in the Gospel of John, John is very interested in us knowing that the relationship that Jesus Christ has created between us and God is real and that it's lasting. Jesus is going to say things like, the ones the Father has given to me cannot be snatched out of my hands. He's not saying you can't leave if you love something else more than Him. But you don't leave accidentally. You have to choose to leave. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness does not overcome it. Praise God. We're held in his hands. We're his. Verse 6 talks about John pointing at Jesus. He's the last of the prophets, like the Old Testament prophets. He comes back to John. Remember, we had lettuce in the sandwich on top and bottom. He comes back to John in verse 15 and talks about him pointing at Jesus and saying, he's the one I was talking about. The, the Old Testament prophets have been pointing at Jesus all along. That's what they've all done. From the very beginning, when the darkness came into the world and God comes in judgment on the woman and he tells her, you'll have a descendant who will crush Satan's head. 
He'll strike at your descendant's heel, but your descendant will crush his head. I don't know about y'all, but I like crushing snakes' heads. I like doing it with a 12-gauge at distance, you know. And, and if I have a 10-gauge, I prefer that. You know, the bigger, the better. The, the, the more destructive, the better I like it. Yay. I'm sorry, I haven't heard that in so long. I don't know what to do. Where was I? Satan's head's getting crushed, right? There we go. Jesus is coming to crush Satan. David writes a psalm in 22. He thinks he's thinking about him on his own self. I'm, I'm so messed up, like my bones are all out of joint, and, and I'm surrounded by all these enemies. And he, he doesn't describe himself. He uses such great hyperbole in describing himself that he's actually describing Jesus on the cross. They pierce my hands and feet, and my bones are out of joint. My mouth is dried up. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from my groaning? Isaiah sits down and, and everybody knows David's going to have a child that's going to sit on his throne forever and that, that a promise has been made to Abraham that one of your descendants will bring a blessing to the whole world. Isaiah writes, not about a king on a throne, but about a servant who suffers. By his stripes you're healed. The iniquity of us all has been laid on him. They're all talking about Jesus. They're all pointing to Jesus. John's the last pointer. The last one who says, that's the one. In the next chapter, he's going to point at Jesus and say, that's the Lamb of God. That's the one. And he's come into the world, verse 9. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. We're getting closer to the meat. Verse 14, the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us, and we've seen His glory. He didn't stop being God. It says all through John again and again, I am, I am, I am. On occasion, he even says, I am he. And if you've read Isaiah beginning in chapter 41, that's the way God describes himself over and over and over and over and over again. I am he. I am. I am. That's his name. Jesus is not getting, giving up his godness. He just takes on us and takes on flesh. It's a change I can't imagine. I've had some wonderful dogs in my life, mainly dachshunds. They're bullheaded and they won't listen, but they really love you when they want to. And, and he had a German Shepherd healer that was great. I just, I love those dogs. I could go on and on and on and on about them, but I will never agree to become a dog. I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. I like to hold the handle on the leash, not wear it on my collar. Jesus became human. He became flesh. He stepped from the glory of heaven to being a person who walked everywhere and was spit on and beaten and never trusted John says, we beheld his glory. It's in verse 14. Glory. In the synoptic gospels, in Matthew, you would see the glory of Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. He's on a mountain with three of his disciples and he is changed into his heavenly glory before them and they see it in John that doesn't happen that story is not told because in John the glory of Jesus is seen when he's lifted up on a cross to die for mankind the great thing that God did sacrificing himself for us shows the glory of God 
And what glory it is. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. In that we see His glory. The glory of the one and only Son who's full of grace and truth. All this is done. We got the bread, we got the mayo, we've got the lettuce, we got the other vegetables, and finally we get to the meat. Why did God do all this? What was the point of all of it? Look in verse 12, or verse, uh, um, let's back up to verse 10. He's in the world. And though the world was made through him, the world didn't recognize him. He made it. It's his. He created it. But when they looked at him, they didn't see him for who he is. They don't know him. You imagine coming home and your kids are terrified of you and think you're a stranger? Can you imagine coming to your house and your mate doesn't recognize you? Jesus comes not only to the world he made, but to the people he called and brought out of Egypt, and he comes to them, and they won't see him for who he is. But, and he came to that which his own, his own did not receive him. Verse 12, yet all who did receive him, who believed on his name, this is as if John is cutting the list short. There's a lot of things we need to do. But it starts with accepting who he is and believing that he is God come in the flesh and believing that his glory is on the cross. And when we... When we Accept who he is when we recognize and receive him. And there's a lot packed into believing and receiving in John. But when we do, we get the right to become children of God. It's a marvelous thing, folks. You get to be God's child years ago we let a young lady come and live at her house she uh she would scream in the middle of the night no schedule or anything just scream and we'd have to get up and calm her down and settle her down she never cleaned up a thing she didn't clean up her room she didn't do any laundry we had to do all that for her sometimes at meals she would throw food at us of course, she was an infant. She was our daughter. <laughs> Do you know what privilege you get in being a child in a home with a loving parent? You get to be a child of God. You, Romans chapter 8, you get to call him daddy. There's two people in the world that have called me daddy. And to this day, if they call and say, daddy, they have whatever I have that they need. My time, my wealth, anything. And they're going to get an inheritance someday. A big stack of bills. <laughs> they're going to get it. You can call him daddy and he listens. You're going to have an inheritance. You get to go live with him. some things about my home that my, my children love and disturbingly in this moving process they've mentioned a couple of things that they want when I kick out 
I keep telling them, it's yours. You, everything I have is going to be yours. It's yours. You get to call his home your home. And so we can actually sing with, with heartfelt honesty. This world is not my home. I'm just passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. This is made possible not because of a human decision. Look in verse 13. These are not children born of natural descent or human decision or a husband's will. Now, I know there are things that you need to decide and you need to do to be a child of God. This gift that you're handed must be unwrapped. It's his gift. He can give it with any stipulations he wants. He's made them very easy, very simple to trust him, believe in him and who he is, and to repent, turn from an old life, and be buried with him in baptism, raised to newness of life, get a new life because of that death experience that you join the death of Jesus and are raised But you can do all of that, and if he had not done this, it would be meaningless. The power of us becoming children of God is in the decision of God. God wants you to be his child. God wants you to live with him in eternity. God wants you to wear his name. God wants you so much that he had a son who has been with him for eternity. Because wherever you put the beginning, wherever you put the beginning, if you go a million years before God said, let there be light, the word already was with God. It already was God. There has been fellowship forever until he hangs on a cross and becomes sin. Not his sin. My sin and your sin. And we behold his glory. And there is the grace and the truth that makes us children of God. John's going to write a lot more. But that's the point of all that he writes. What John teaches us is so that we will know through Jesus we can become God's children. We can belong to Him. I want you to be a child of God. If you want to know more about that, I would love, others in this congregation would love nothing more than to sit down with you and open the Word of God and say, what does God say about being His child? And how can that be possible? I promise you, there are multiple people here that love nothing more than to share that good news with people around them. Please. Let God's decision apply to you. He came to that which is his own. His own did not receive him. You're one of his own. He made you. Receive him. Believe who he says he is. And let him make you a child of God. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you so much for the the choice you've made in sending a Savior for us. A Savior that not only pays for our sins, but knows you and is divine like you and helps us to experience you. Father, please open our hearts to that truth. Lead us to be your children. Please, Father, in Jesus' name, amen.